introduce Niva Takahashi. And we actually met in 2007 at JCU, like an age or so ago. And yeah, um, he has been doing some great science in Australia, a PhD at Curtin, and now working for PSIRO on eDNA and making it fair. So I'll let you do okay. your thing. Thank you so much, Roger, and thank you for having me, Yoko san and Roger and Tim. It's amazing hospitality here, and I'm really excited to be here today. Um, so I, my name is Miwa, as Roger introduced, like we met in Townsville, we studied together, and then now we are in the separate places in the world, but it's um, so nice to see him again in different parts of the world. And so today I want to talk about my project to make eDNA data fair. Fair stands for findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. So in this talk, I will talk a little bit about me, but the main per main goal is to uh, introduce you about fair principle, fair value, why do we need to make eDNA fair, and how to make eDNA fair as well. So I was born and raised in Tokyo, and then I went to Australia when I was 18. I just finished my high school, and then I was working on a diving, uh, diving boat. Then I decided to study marine biology, so I went a little bit south of Cairns in Townsville. That's where I met Roger. I did my undergrad and honors degree, and the best thing I did during that degree was volunteering for researchers in the field. So I got to go diving for free, which is amazing as a poor student, but also I got to learn how the research field is like, and I really liked it. I got to swim with the minky whales, volunteering for the project. I also went to Papua New Guinea for another researchers, and then got to see beautiful reefs and people, culture and amazing accommodation like this. This is one of the most remote and roughest field trip I did. Stayed there for one week. And I loved it so much. So I decided to do honors degree. And that was to compare latitudinal gradients in a pelagic lab duration of fish. So I collected juvenile fish from uh, these places. Look at tiny little outlets and then I just try to understand the patterns there. Then uh, after that, I work as a research assistant for JCU and Ames as well. I was involved in multiple projects, looking at coral, sponge, foraminifera, but the main thing I did was a seagrass long-term monitoring. So all along the GBR, Great Barrier Reef, I was going to the field and collecting data every three months. And again, I got to go to PNG, another amazing field trip there. And this site was really unique because um, there was a volcanic CO2 seep in a shallow coral reef. So that site is exposed to high CO2 level, low pH for decades. And that's amazing in situ ocean acidification experiment site. So we went there to look at the impact of those onto different organisms. And I was in charge of the seagrass part. And seagrass was loving it. it. It was loving this high CO2. It was growing really fast, amazing big biomass. On the other hand, coral was struggling. And so one of the papers published from this project was winner and loser in the coral reef with the ocean classification. And you can tell which one is which from these photos. Then um, after that, I quit my job. to understand the ecology. 
I did some molecular work, metabolic coding dietary study trend lab. And that was the first molecular work I did in my life. So it was a very steep learning curve. And uh, thanks to this project, I got a job after PhD as a research associate and a lab tech at Curtin University. There's a trend lab in the Indian Frontiers, so that's where I worked. And also I was working as a lab tech and bioinformatics um, for eDNA project at CSIRO. Then now, I last year, I started doing a postdoc at CSIRO, and the project is to uh, make eDNA data fair. And the reason why I'm in Okinawa now is because there's a conference next week, and it's a biodiversity data standard conference. So it's going to be really relevant for my projects. I'm really excited about it. So that was a bit about me, and now I'm going to get into this fair topic. So open data is probably more familiar term for you guys. How many of you have heard of fair principles? Yeah, and I didn't know the term before I started this project or before I started thinking about this project. And uh, but open data, open science, it's a very familiar term for us now. So open data is about transparency and the reproducibility of study. But fair principle goes more beyond that. So it's a it's not just about findability and accessibility, F and A, but also we want to make the data interoperable so that we can reuse them for further studies. So it's about long-term value of data, generation of further knowledge and speed, and also cost-saving measure as well. We don't need to spend thousands of dollars going in the field and just analyzing and producing the data. We can recycle the data. And so that's a slight difference between those two terms. And why do we need to make eDNA data fair? So we all know that we need tools to support better level of monitoring because of number of environmental stresses around the world. Mm -hmm. And eDNA is a very powerful tool for biomonitoring. And because of that, number of studies, eDNA studies have gone up very rapidly in the last 10 years. It's a review paper we did on aquatic eDNA studies on macrofauna. So when you think about other type of eDNA samples like sediment, soil, air, or microfauna, microorganism, the number of papers per year could be easily more than 1,000. So each of these day study produced tremendous amount of DNA sequences and species distribution, uh, sorry, species occurrence data. And if we have all this data fed, then we can do all sort of things. For example, further studies at extended time and space that is impossible to do with a single study. And we can also increase species identification accuracy by reanalyzing eDNA sequences, archived sequences, using updated reference databases. And then we can also enhance collaboration through um, by reusing the data from different institutes, different countries, and through these activities, we can generate knowledge at speed, and ultimately, we can support decision-making. And current eDNA data life cycle is, unfortunately, many of the data are single-use only, getting lost somewhere in this map. And number of studies explore the, um, why, why the data is not shared. So actually, those studies are social science studies, try to understand the behavioral part of a scientist. Why don't we share data? And they identify a number of barriers, including perceived barriers, such as uh, people are not aware about the value of the data for other researchers, or they might be worried that there's some potential mistakes and then those mistakes will be spotted if you share data, or resistance to openly share data. And that's also, very understanding because we all live in a very competitive research world, unfortunately, and we spend a month and a month writing funding application. We finally win the money, then spend a month and a month going to the field, collect samples, process that, and produce data. So people are resistant to share that kind of data that so much effort have spent on to anyone openly for free. And then there's also they, those kind of studies identify that people are not aware about this issue or open data value in general. So those are the examples of perceived barriers. And then changing this kind of um, mindset and behavior is going to make a huge impact in the 
towards a fair data practice. And there are also technical and resource limitations and lack of time is a number of reasons that we all have and it's completely understandable. And also some people might be willing to share data, but they don't have skills, tools, or standards to navigate data management system. So these are the bottlenecks that we are trying to overcome in my project. And, but some data are made public these days, especially. And that is um, thankfully to mostly uh, because of this publication, public data archiving policy. So now journals, institutions, funding agency, they make this agreement that if you want to publish the data in this journal, you need to make the data available. So that kind of policy is implemented in a number of journals. And then that has a huge impact to change scientists' behavior. And now if you can share data into Dryad, and although there are open data repositories, so it's quite uh, commonly used. And also GBIF, Global Biodiversity Information Facility, OBIS, Atlas of Living in Australia, they're all similar type of database that collects um, species occurrence data, mostly observation data. So from video analysis or transects or citizen science, but now they are implementing eDNA um, database into their system. And NCBI is a common, like we all know NCBI, but they're actually under the umbrella of INSDC, uh, International Nuclear Sex Nucleotide Sequence Database Collaboration. And then there's ENA and DDBJ. They exchange data at almost daily basis. So they're pretty much identical database and you can submit your eDNA sequence there. So with this uh, database is available and the people, more and more people are making a data uh, available through them. Now they are findable and accessible. And so now, I would like to show you some of the examples of the eDNA databases. And I mentioned about NCBI. So they accept now the short uh, sequence reader archives from eDNA sequences. And then those biodiversity database also are, are implementing eDNA um, space in their platform. Here's some couple of study examples that uh, where the data shared into ALA. And ALA, OBIS, GV, they're all under the same umbrella and then they exchange the data as well. So that data went into GV automatically. And as you can see that tens of thousands of uh, records have been downloaded and then cited. So there's a huge advantage for researchers here to share data because the studies become more visible and cited. And those things are actually, um, I don't, um, investigated with the studies and then published here as so you can see a citation of that advantage of linking publications to research data and so there are a few studies proving that sharing your data make your study more visible and cited. Here's another beautiful example of uh, from New Zealand it's uh, run by Wilder Lab you can see thousands of samples collected all through New Zealand you can go into individual database uh, data set sampling point and it gives you a species list with photos, tree of life and the tables like this. And here's another similar example from Japan. I'm sure you are familiar with this, but um, this is an anemone database and you can see samples have been collected from all over Japan. And they also have a raw sequence data available there, not only about OTU table and species list. So it's a very um, heavy, big data set out there. And so through this, um, the F and A can be ticked, but unfortunately, they're still not interoperable and reusable. And one of the reasons is because they use different formats. So the data in the different places, different databases cannot talk to each other. And another reason is because uh, the data, archive data are half empty. So, when you submit a data to Dryad and then you can link that to um, in your data sharing statement in your paper, that data can be just FASTQ files sometimes or OTU table. But just with that, we cannot really reuse them. We need information about the sample. So it's a sample metadata is missing in a lot of cases. So you need a table with the sample names and then where they were collected, how they were processed and so on. So we don't wanna 
have all this, you know, valuable archive data, but still not complete and we cannot reuse them. So the, this is how we are going to challenge these, uh, these limitations. So this is an infographic of our project starting from eDNA process, uh, sampling and the data generation. But at this moment, maybe I can, did you give me a pointer? Uh, this one. Yeah. Just press the, uh, can you switch to laser pointer on your presentation? Like switch in your presentation at the bottom left? Yeah, this one. You should be able to switch laser to pointer. pointer. Hmm. Oh, no. And then, yeah, and now you just, Navigate, but this there. one, okay. And press it and move it. Okay, a bit tricky. <laughs> so at this moment, the data is not um, standardized. So the pieces of puzzle from different studies cannot fit together, but we're going to change, it might be easier just using this mouse pad. <laughs> we're going to change this life, data life cycle through these activities here. So this is what we've been working on in the last one year. And then the outcome of that is gonna be that the data will be in the same format. We can fit them those puzzle pieces together. We can also plug in with other type of biodiversity data. And then in the result, we're gonna have a big biodiversity data set. So I'm gonna walk you through this middle part, what we've been doing in this project. And firstly, about collaboration. So collaboration is, is the key for this project. And we now have an EDNA working group, group of more than 20 people, uh, the researchers from different institutions, different countries. And we are EDNA researchers, database managers, journal editors, and we're all really enthusiastic towards fair data. So we're working together towards it. Um, so some of them are from uh, database managers. So we, we're uh, trying to overcome this type of infrastructure, infrastructure aspects of it. And the reason why we have the journal editors on board is because we're thinking about this part, policy. And so I mentioned that journals, they implemented this data sharing policy and then that is working really well. So a lot of data are open now. And they do recognize that, however, the data shared is not in the standardized format, missing some important information, so still not fair. And they see the value of fair, uh, fair principles. They see the value of eDNA data. So we're working together to implement this um, fair eDNA guidelines into the publication procedure. So we're gonna work with the eDNA environmental DNA journal first. And then once we start with that, we're gonna go into other type of other Wiley journals like ecology evolution, molecular ecology. They also have a, they also work very closely with other publishers. So we're gonna have a potential to expand this a lot wider than this. And then uh, with this working group, we are now establishing this, we are standardizing the data format and the vocabulary. And the key here is complete information and the machine readability. And so that we can achieve this I and R part. And first thing we did was to define what data types are important to be shared. So we don't wanna have the archive data half empty. So this will be the complete version. So first thing on the top is the study metadata and the sample metadata. I mentioned about sample metadata earlier, but study metadata is basically a data that applies to the whole study or whole data set. So it can be who was you know, sharing the data, who, who recorded the data, what's the project name, what the primers applied in this whole data set and sequencing method and so on. Then the sample data, metadata is the uh, detailed information about each samples. Then it goes into either target taxon study detection type or multi-taxa detection. So most commonly the metabar coding approach. So there will be raw eDNA sequences, OTU tables, there are two types, raw and a curated one. Curated one is the more important one, but as eDNA researchers, we all know that 
from here to here, there are so many curation steps applied and everyone uses all sort of different parameters and protocols. So we also want to preserve this part to understand what kind of quality filtering were applied there. And that's the same reason why we also want to have a raw DNA sequence as well. So reusers can also go back to the raw sequences and then they can run their own pipeline there. Then the sequence information, ASD or OTU IDs, and then sequences, and then taxonomic identification information. And here you can see this percentage match, quality, uh, query coverage. So some sort of like bioinformatic um, thresholds and quality assurance uh, parameters are there. And that's because data, the original eDNA studies can have all sort of different threshold levels. And then data reusers also have their own requirement. So having this in an organized machine readable way is a really key so that data reusers can look at it and filter data in and out based on their requirement. And then the next thing we did was to develop a metadata checklist. So it's basically this uh, sample metadata, the column headers, and then a study metadata, those list on the last and the first column. And now this is the small fraction of a checklist table. And you can see the sections. So it starts from the project information. It goes into like sample collection, storage, and then sequencing methods and bioinformatics all the way down to bioinformatics as well. And here's a field name, descriptions, examples, and so on. And now there are 275 fields. And we're still developing this, but they're more or less final version. So it's not going to go a lot more than this. And the reason why we have so many fields is because we want to have a complete information. And you might be thinking like, well, that's a lot of fields and I don't like that. It's going to take me so much time to format my data and fill all this information. Um, but there's only 36 mandatory fields. So we define these requirement levels and those mandatory fields can be latitude, longitude, date and time. Uh, primers use, project name. So this is a very like key information. Everyone has your own, you know, your own data set. So hopefully that's not going to take much time to fill 36 monetary fields. And then there are um, a couple of hundred of uh, recommended and optional fields. And those terms are actually, uh, most of them come from existing standards. And there is two main ones. That one is called Darwin Core. And the other one is minimum information about any X sequence. It's a weird name, but it's called MixS. And Darwin Core was developed by Biodiversity Information Standards. And that's actually the conference that I'm going next week. And um, so they, they, this, they have a big list checklist for specifically for biodiversity data. So sampling methods, but also uh, like, for example, family, genus, species, and things like that. And the mixes, on the other hand, is focusing on the molecular side, so primer uh, information, sequencing information, and so on. But they are developed for different, not for eDNA data. So mixes originally was uh, developed for molecular, um, like biomolecular, biomedical science, and that we call ecological data, eDNA. is ecological data, but then it also has a little unique side about it. So we try to implement as much as I can from existing databases and existing standards, but we also did create a few terms that, uh, that is required to describe this unique characters of eDNA workflows and data. And then now going into machine readability part. And so we have a few strategies we apply to make a data machine readable. And one is the fixed field name. So field name or data column header has to be in this way. So for example, sample size needs to be written as sum underscore size. And so you need to find the field name from here. And if it's not there, then you can go to, uh, you can create your own as well. But if it's there, use this name. Then also format is fixed in some of them. So you can see here the field type uh, free text, uh, you can type anything you want, numeric, it's only the number, and then there's a fixed term here, 
and also fixed format. So I'm talking about fixed format. Latitude, longitude needs to be in decimal degrees using WGS 84 data. The date and time has to be in ISO 8601. And that's the format example there, year date, year month date, capital T, the time, and the difference, the minus seven hour is the diff time difference with the UTC. And it's very, very specific. Um, has anyone heard of this uh, this type of date and time format? Yeah? Yeah, you've been. And um, so if you are familiar with this, like a big data set, and then you probably know this. And I didn't know it before I started this project. And then I didn't like it at the beginning because no one really used this format. And, you know, we all have a date and a time in a separate field. And then this is really, you know, adding extra work for us. But because majority of the database actually use this, we also need to follow that so that our database can be plugged in with other type of data sets. So there's a lot of nitty gritty here to make everything machine readable. And unfortunately we need to follow these little rules. And then um, numeric variables has also some rules. So um, it's only that the numbers can be entered here and the unit is specified here. So it's about the filter pore size. And in this way, you don't specify your unit in the entry or in the field name, it's already preset. And there's also fixed terms here, for example, sample size unit. So talking about numeric variable, um, sometimes we cannot specify units. So in that, that kind of case, we give uh, options of units and you need to select it from here. And another example is the target gene, like CO1, for example, can be spelled out in so many different ways. And if we have a CO1 data set from different studies spelled in different way, then it's very difficult to collect them together. So we have a big list of target gene regions, and then you select the term from them. So this is uh, all these little details of rules to make this machine uh, and to make DNA data fair. And I understand that um, this formatting can take time and it's really tedious and we're all short in time. So we're developing tools and scripts to help with that. So one of the scripts that we developed was um, data metadata validator. So once you format your data in this, uh, according to the guidelines, there might be still some mistakes. So you can drag your file in there and then submit then it will give you some output with the warning and error messages. And those can be, for example, latitude, longitude is a mandatory field, but it's missing. Or this is a fixed term, but you enter something that is not listed from this option, something like that. So this is the work that we've been doing and trying to achieve this uh, fair EDA, fair data. And once it's, um, once it's, formatted where to publish. And this is a whole another avenue about you know making an eDNA fair. And then I, I'm gonna go through a little bit of that. So we there are already, as I've shown you in earlier slides, there are some databases that accept eDNA data already. And for example, row sequences and sample study metadata can go into NCBI or any other INSTC um, databases. And then GBIF and OBIS, if it's a marine data, which might be the case for you, most of you guys, it can go into OBIS and then the data in OBIS will automatically go to GBIF anyway. But um, so basically they accept the studies uh, metadata, OTU table, the curated OTU table, and then the bottom one, the DNA sequence data. And they're not, um, so they're interested in species occurrence data. That's the um, policy or scope of the whole um, database. So that's why they're not going into the raw DNA sequences, but then the other information are important for them. And um, then, also, you can submit your data as 
you know, the package of the whole thing that is described there into dryers and all the, all these open uh, repository places. However, I put a question mark there because it is, um, the recommendation is more to use this existing big database that is organized and then you, they combine your data with other studies in their platform. And then, but dry as an order, your data is gonna sit there and you get a DOI and then all this link is gonna last there forever, but it's still just individual data and then it's sitting there alone. So data reusers have to go into individual link and then extract the data and collate them together. And that's not that hard as long as all the data is formatted in an organized manner like this, but, um, GB, if you submit the data into JB, if they would uh, keep that, um, they will put that together with other databases and you can see your data along with the thousands and thousands of observation data. So the next slide, couple of slides, it's actually um, Tobias from GB gave me those two slides. And uh, Tobias is one of the collaborators um, for this project, and he's been working a lot to implement eDNA data into GBIP. And so I talk about this uh, opportunity to give a talk here today, and then he got really excited, and he asked me to add this kind of slice uh, so uh, we can introduce a bit about GBIP's work. This is, um, so first thing is the benefits of sharing data sets in GBIP. That's similar to what I already explained, but uh, basically you can increase, I'm talking about here, so you can increase the visibility and the citations of your work. Then you can contribute to global diversity knowledge and new data is going to be preserved and then standardized in their platforms. And then they're gonna live there forever. So data in GB is going to be fair. And um, then once you submit your data into GB, they have this kind of metrics that you can track how many data have been downloaded, how much has been cited, which can be a really important uh, um, parameters for researchers. And this one is all about the DNA derived data. So GBIF, most of the GBIF data is still the observation data from um, traditional methods, but um, now they're getting more and more DNA data. So this is the uh, guideline about DNA derived data publication into GB. And some section is about eDNA. So it's a quite big document, but uh, it's worth a read. And they also developed this uh, tool to uh, submit eDNA data into their system. And it's a prototype. So they're still uh, working with eDNA researchers, trying it out, getting a lot of feedback so they can improve it. And you can always be involved in this process. Like if you're interested in submitting your data into GB, I would recommend to contact Tobias. And then he's really, he's a very friendly guy. And then he's super open to collaboration, very keen to help individual researchers who want to submit the data into GB and finding any difficulties, he will help you with that. So um, yeah, you can uh, get in touch with him or you can tell me and then I can introduce you to Tobias as well. So what's next? Um, the, the plan we have now is, um, sorry, before we go into the policy. So we, are, we worked, we're working hard on this middle part here, and then we're gonna publish this as a guidelines of the best practice of eDNA data formatting and publication guidelines. And that publication, probably we're going to do the preprint first in the next few weeks or so. So once it's done, I would like to send it uh, the news to you guys so you can have a look. And then it's going to be also published in a peer review paper. And once that's done, we're going to integ integrate the guidelines into policy. As I mentioned, we're going to work with the Environmental DNA Journal first. And then uh, we run some workshop to raise awareness about fair value, but also we can get into this detail of our guidelines, all the rules, nitty gritty of it, so we can help researchers to uh, get started with that guidelines. And then we also want to continue developing formatting tools. So if you have your institute have a big database sitting for the institution, 
in organized manner, then it will be quite straightforward to write a script to format from that type of uh, that format into this uh, fair DNA format that we're recommending. So we got to we we want to identify you know which institution have a big database willing to format the data and then share it, and then we want to uh, collaborate with them to write the scripts and tools for that kind of things. Then. Um, we also want to keep revising and updating the guidelines. So we're gonna we are super open to uh, to receive any feedbacks once it's published, and then people start using, and then they might find like, oh, my data type doesn't really fit into this guideline. What do I need to do? And we can work together and come up with a solution, and we can implement this kind of new things into the updated version. And also eDNA is a very fast evolving field and then there's gonna be new technology that we didn't take into account in this version of guidelines. So we need updates for that. And we're gonna keep working on that. Then we actually wanna reuse the eDNA data for further studies. So maybe we can do some sort of species distribution modeling using a big eDNA data set and that would be really amazing. Or we can actually run like reanalysis of species ID to see how much improves with time. Um, yeah. And then finally, and very importantly, we wanna harmonize fair and care. Has anyone heard of care principle before? And yeah. So um, fair is about data centric, but care is more about people and purpose oriented. And so care stands for collective benefit, authority to control responsibility and ethics. And so these principles are developed by the Global Indigenous Data Alliance to respect the data, uh, to, to, um, to make sure that the data is used in a respectful manner for indigenous people and the local community. So harmonizing fair and care is a really essential part. And then it's a, it's a big, um, we're really working hard a lot on this, especially in Australia, country like Australia or New Zealand, US, Canada, we're working together. There's a whole session about care principles next week in the conference. So I'm really keen to uh, go into the session and then learn a lot more. And um, yeah, I'm, I'm curious to know what is happening, if there's anything like this kind of topic uh, discussion in Japan or Okinawa. So it's very unique to different regions. Each region have a different uh, histories and uh, different uh, approach towards the care, care principle. So it's a lot to learn for me and I would like to work towards that. And, uh, sorry, this was, um, I just went through this. Okay, so the last slide and um, recap of the talk. So why do we need to make eDNA fair? Because eDNA data is a remarkable and needed, very valuable biodiversity data, but currently they're not fair. How are we gonna make that happen? We're working with existing databases, journals, and eDNA researchers. We're standardizing data formats and vocabularies, and then we're, we're creating formatting tools and raising awareness about fair value and what kind of tools are available and the guidelines are there. Then ultimately, we can have a bigger and a better data for environmental management. I thank you so much for all the attention, listening to my talk, and it was a bit hard time of the day to focus on this kind of thing. So I really appreciate that. And I hope you got a good understanding of fair values now, and um, you agree that we should work together towards fair eDNA data to make this value, the value of eDNA, the power of eDNA, go well beyond what we can do just now at this moment. Um, I would like to receive any feedbacks, any questions, and um, yeah, now or later, anytime, <laughs> you can contact me on the email as well. Thank you very much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, maybe we check online first if there's any questions online. You can just unmute and ask directly or post it in the chat.
of other things. So I might come back to that. If there's any questions in the audience of people or comments. Or... Um, I just, I understand that you also have to talk to journals to mm -hmm. basically, right. So how receptive are the journals about, you know, the fair principles and how collab they, do they get on board? Is it easy to engage with them? Or? Yeah, yeah, they are really uh, keen to engage. Yeah, so as I mentioned, um, we started talking with the Wiley editors and then straight away they said, yes, we've been already, you know, talking a lot about fair principles. Open science is, is already there. We almost achieved it, but fair is not there yet. So let's work together. And then each, it's, it's tricky to make, you know, each science field, eDNA has their own unique thing, and then biology, other types, they have their own unique eDNA data types. So we need to work for individual cases, mm -hmm. and the journals don't really have a capacity to do that. So we eDNA researchers need to get into this eDNA specific part, and then that's why we're doing it. And then they are really uh, keen to get our output into their system. Yeah. Have you made like a, a website or anything? Yeah. And we're going to make a website. We, it's already under development. The script's already there in the GitHub, and uh, but it's not openly available yet. But once it's in the pre print, I think in a few weeks, it's going to be available. Yeah, so we'll let you know. I might send an email to Roger and then he can send it to you guys. I was just about to submit the paper to eDNA. Yeah, um, with your data attached? With, with his data. Um, yes. Uh huh, yeah, okay. Switch the format. I'm not sure if there's time to do, yeah. do it already, but mm -hmm. maybe when the news come back. Yeah, okay. Yeah, but you're already trying to make your data available. When in your paper. I basically uploaded the sequence on it's yeah. okay, that's about it, right? So all these little extra steps are okay. Yeah. Yeah, good to know. Charles. Yeah. I think 20 years ago when people were talking about um uh like machine readable metadata, they liked a lot ontologies, mm -hmm. uh, you know, structured vocabularies. Uh we have the gene ontology, sequence ontology, etc. Uh, and uh, I was wondering, like on your checklist, you have uh, you you have like hundreds of metadata that you uh, that uh, that can be uh, provided. I was wondering if at any point, you know, you thought or somebody suggested, you know, why don't you use ontologies to uh, to describe what it is, so that you know, at that time, inter artificial intelligence was not envisioned to be language models that learn. So you would really have to say, you know, temperature, it's a unit of measurement. Uh, measurement is numbers, <laughs> that kind of things. Uh, yeah. yeah, so I did learn about ontology as well at the start of my project, and it was a whole new thing to me, and there are so many of them. So we are using as much as we can. So for example, sample type is from ontology list, environmental ontology list, and then ecosystem type, like is it a marine sample, freshwater sample, mm -hmm. they're from ontology terms. Um, what else do we use? Mm, yeah, if I look into the checklist, um, yeah, I might be able to spot more, but there are a few of those, yeah. And uh, if you find anything that we're missing in the checklist, then you know that, oh, there's this actually ontology list there. Let me know. Yep. And then I can implement that as well. Yep. Yeah. So in that way, like we're really open to any feedbacks and the collaboration. This is really open to collaboration, this project. So um, yeah, any feedbacks would be appreciated. I think some of it was also be interesting for Nicolas because he works a lot with like databases and receiving data. So we recorded the talks, I might share it with him. Yeah. So there is a guy in um, Charles's lab who is a bioinformatician, but yeah, also does like a lot of, he's wrote an eDNA, the taxonomic assignment script for us, based mm -hmm. on our um, recommendations or requests. Yeah. So we're using that now for eDNA taxonomic Right, yeah. So, so he worked a lot with, Okay. It might be interesting. Yeah. Actually, there's a lot of pipelines. For instance, you know, one of one of the, the documents that uh, 
that are needed and that can be submitted that you show this, this sort of sample sheet. And uh, you know, there are some pipelines that use sample sheets to provide, provide the data. Now, if those pipelines, they already require that that sample sheet conforms to the standards, uh, then once people, they have run the pipeline, did their analysis, they already get something that they don't need to change later. Exactly, yeah. yeah, that's the main goal. So once people know about this guideline and then the standardized format, from the beginning of the study, you can start filling using those terms. Yeah. And also by Manic Pipeline, the output can be in this format. And mm -hmm. then that would be really uh, the way to go to save a time and then make everything more smooth. Mm -hmm. And then it's a... Uh, like some people might have some restriction about sharing the data. So that's also understandable. And then, but still like within the lab, for example, I think it's a great advantage to have some sort of standardized format across the researchers so that, you know, within the lab, at least data can be collected and then run some further analysis or something. Yeah, I think if someone has restrictions, even if they do the same exercise internally, keep it and then if there's restrictions or list that they can just submit it, mm -hmm. or even like if they download other stuff, but their lab is already the format exactly. in the database, I think. It's yeah, so the restriction can be until the data is, you know, that, well, the study is published. So until then, you can still hold it. But then once the restriction is done, then um, it's ready to go. And even GBIF, uh, there is a way to do that. You can submit the data already saying, actually, you cannot share everything openly at this stage. But then you can change the form, um, the, the restriction later, and it's ready to go. Hmm. Anyone else? So I have a question to you guys, actually. Um, so in OIST, do you guys um, have any sort of like data archiving system? Or I guess backupping for sure, like, you know, you have to back up the data for certain years. But uh, is there any structured format or structured way? To my knowledge, like we do it internally in our unit. We have both, like we have a bucket on the high performance computer, and then we for very important stuff. We take a second backup, and we try to submit as much as possible to NCBI to have it there. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's low term at the moment. It's, it's NCBI. It's like once it's there, we kind of yeah. That's it. Yeah, NCBI is the best backup. Yeah. <laughs> so you you upload your eDNA data into NCBI. Yes. Yeah. 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 Okay. Data, yeah. yeah. But they don't really accept the OTU table at this moment, right? Yeah. It's a bit scattered. So I guess OTU table can go on. This this is a transcriptomic study, but I and a genome assembly. So I put my transcript on count table, my genome, the GTF file with the models and my annotation on, on FigTree, and the rest is on NCBI, so it's kind of separated. Mm -hmm. FigTree was free, but it was a bit of a pain to upload stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And group it, so yeah, it's not, not a good yeah. system. And also NCBI, whenever I need to upload data to NCBI, it's, it's such a pain. Like yeah. it's it's gotten a bit better than maybe ten years ago, but it's still uh, yeah, it's a it's a long process and yeah, it's a painful one, but um, it is very important and and so all these databases they're working towards this eDNA data or metabolic coding data set, and it's still under development. Like they continue working very very hard to improve it. So for example, I have a collaborator from ENA and uh, European Nucleotide Association there with. NCBI, and they are trying to implement submission of OTU table as well. So that's going to happen in the future. And so is GBIF, uh, GBIF and ENA working together and so that they, the data can be linked together. So raw FASTQ files in the ENA or NCBI can be linked to GBIF data set. And then so um, they will be all together in one big data. It would be really powerful. Like that's already happening with, with genomes and transcriptome. Like we upload a genome to NCBI. Usually they do another uh, re annotation, genome annotation. So they find the gene models. And they're much, much better than us at finding gene models, I think. And then if 
NCBI gets updated. Sometimes these gene models get updated. But like you had some uh, query pairwise identity and query coverage information in your mm -hmm. table and, and the genus or whatever. But that data is so much flux. Like if we do a taxonomic assignment now, maybe there's a big fish study coming up in a week. They dump some data on there. And now all the unknowns we have will now be resolved. Mm. So like reanalyzing data, I think is a super important thing. Mm -hmm. And if there is like, if NCBI could have the raw data plus the OTU table plus the sequences and automatically update taxonomic assignments in the background mm -hmm. for people, that, that would be a huge, huge game changer. Yeah. Yeah, we've been talking a lot with uh, Tobias and Judith about it, and it's his dream as well. So he has this, uh, not the FASTQ files, but the FASTA file, or just the text of sequences. And that's all you need to re-blast. So uh, they have that in an organized manner, so that hopefully in the future they can implement that kind of reanalysis. But there is also a challenge as well, because re like blast or you know taxonomic assignment script can be very different and algorithm there are so many different algorithms which gene region do you target or which uh, database do you use and that can be depending on the study scope or mm -hmm. taxa ta target taxa or regions so finding you know like the general like global standardized pipeline is really challenging but uh, it can be maybe a specific or region specific uh, plus script or something like that. But, but then if it was done by NCBI, and again, I think they're very experienced in what they're doing, it would be kind of one standard protocol for mm -hmm. NCBI itself. Like, we also do a lot of like Michael and I both spend hours and hours manually curating uh, the eDNA results. So the quality is now much higher, but it takes a lot of knowledge and time to kind of, if there's two fish and they're equally um, logical, I know, equally matched in the sequence, but one lives in the Pacific and one lives in the Atlantic, it's kind of a no brainer which one it is. Mm. Sometimes it's not clear and it, there's a lot around that through the curation. Yeah, yeah, so it's, you know, removing a non-target taxa or taxa that shouldn't appear in this ecosystem. Like some researchers go through one by one and remove them and someone but really, you know, okay, well, it's not a scope of the study, so they can just have everything yeah. in. And so the curation and data quality can be um, it's a tricky one for DNA. Cool. Yeah, if there's no more questions or comments um, online either, and I think we ended here. You here for your talk. Thank you. I've actually got one question. Sorry. Um, sure. Find me well, if if um you want to ask. Her. Sorry, I've actually got one question. Sorry, before yeah. we, uh, I am from I'm Chris from uh, Kyoto University. Um, doing a eDNA um project. I'm wondering. So you were mentioning um so many different researchers um have used different uh pipelines like bioinformatics pipelines for their um projects uh do you in like long term all all these bioinformatics tools um taking input and outputting um as much as they can towards using this uh, format that you're continuously building is that like uh, a long term goal yes definitely so preserving as much information as possible is our goal and um Pipeline pipeline is a big part of it, and it is we have a quite few uh, fields of metadata checklist. That we have a bioinformatic pipelines fields. Trying, we tried really hard to um, make that in a machine readable way. So, for example, what do you clustering? How was it done? Or what threshold was applied? Or um, you know, the blasting, what database was used and what version and what algorithm. And so those things are listed there and you can enter as, uh, but making that in a fixed term was really tricky because there's just so many options and then there are so many new things coming in as well. So most of them are big, uh, free text fields. 
So it's not completely machine readable way, but there is still at least, you know, this column that describes the methods. And also like sharing a code is always a recommended guideline. And, and um, the code, the link to the code is one of the field in our metadata checklist. So at least you can, you know, find the link very quickly in that way. And then the people who are interested in going in there will uh, be able to find the code. Did I answer to your question? Was it? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, we, in our lab, um, there's like, we have a lot of, um eDNA data from like the past five years for um basically like a, a large project that's happening is uh looking at uh different um migrant groups uh migrating groups for AU sweetfish. Um and uh we have like quite a lot of a lot of data on our supercomputer but it's not it's not really following too much of a um like format like this currently. So I'd be interested in um gain access to your uh, validating software so maybe we can fix it yeah, and... yeah definitely it's uh it's very exciting when every time when i hear that there's a big data set and people willing to share but they don't know um they don't have the guideline yet to follow so uh if that's the case for you i'm really keen to uh connect with you maybe after this talk we can chat on online meeting and um we can yeah. talk about it yeah i can send you an email Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Cool. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Oh, no. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I don't know what time is it. One o'clock? Yeah. All right. Timing. Perfect. Yeah. I know one o'clock, that's Australian time. Two o'clock now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you.